Hi everyone. Okay, so I'll just say a, a few words to open then, and then I'll get out of Robin's way and, um, and let you all enjoy the event. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the, uh, I'm the founder of the LJC. Um, so I'm not a uh, developer myself. Uh, I, I actually run a, a recruitment business called, called RecWorks. Um, so, so what am I doing here? Um, well, firstly, I'm a, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of careers and, and the various different things that, that people can do to, uh, to, to get ahead. Um, my wife hates it as I'm usually the one at the, uh, at the dinner parties trying to give everyone um, recruitment or, or career advice. Um, but but working, in, working in recruitment, um, it, it's pretty cool for someone like me because you get to see people's careers and it gives you a real chance to, to study people's careers and see how some people go like really quickly uh, straight to the top and other people stay at the same level and, and, and some people love their careers and others don't. Um, now, in, in truth, when I set up the LJC, uh, 13 years ago, I don't think I really knew what I was getting myself into. Um, I think I hadn't had an image of maybe a, a couple of hundred people in it or something like that. Uh, we're up to something like 7,500 now, um, and it truly is this, this international community doing so much good out there. Um, but for, for a career geek like, like me, you get to see the impact that people can have on their careers from, from getting involved in these different ways and then again study those over time. Um, so, so what we're doing with RecWorks, where, where we've built RecWorks up is we've tried to build it around this, this principle of, of recruitment being this, this force of good in the industry. Um, so a lot of the work that we do sits somewhere between giving back to the, the people that we've worked with and, and paying it forward to, to help try and bring people together, use our position at the heart of the, uh, of the industry to bring people together as connectors um, to try and help everyone move forward. Um, so a few examples of this, uh, we've run over 600 uh, events now, LJC events. Um, we've helped 2,000 people um, meet uh, mentors, personal one-to-one -one mentor introductions. Um, and we've, uh, we've launched careers of, of a lot of current conference speakers and, and people that, that we encourage to give their first talks through, through the LJC and, and, and loads more. And I mean, most recently, this, this event is, um, I think, our 17th now uh, that we've run virtual event. Um, so yeah, we're always out there trying to trying to do these things to help give you guys a chance to to take your career um, up and and, and, and yeah, benefit from from the community. And so it's all powered and, and driven by the revenue that comes from recruitment and the relationships that um, that we make off the back of that. So if anybody is interested in looking for a job either now or, or in the future, always give us a give us a shout. Um, and if anyone's thinking of hiring, um, then yeah, please do let us know, and, and we'll be more than happy to help. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Robin Moffat. Uh, so for those of you that, that haven't heard Robin speak before, he's a senior developer advocate at Confluent, uh, which is the company that was founded by the creators of Apache Kafka. Uh, he's been speaking at conferences since 2009, including QCon, DevOps, Strata, and, and a very long list of others, um, and is based up in Ilkley in, in West Yorkshire. So it's, uh, it's lovely to get a chance to, to hear and talk to you guys down in London. So. Without further ado, Robin, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Barry. And uh, thanks very much to, to RecWorks, to Barry, to Don for organising and hosting this. Uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to speak to so many people. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, I'm interested, a few of you got video on, um, maybe we should do the use of the show of hands thing. Who, who's actually using Apache Kafka today? Uh, kind, of, kind of interested, a few people. Yeah. No, so I normally do this like at a meetup in front of the, uh, and you can like look around the room and you can actually gauge it. It doesn't work in quite so well in the online setting. Um, let's, I can never work out sharing my screen when it's full screen. So let's uh, bear with me. Whilst I do this, share screen, and share screen. And do that. So. The first talk I'm going to do is about using Kafka, uh, Kafka Connect, KSQL DB, to build out a streaming data pipeline. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what Kafka is and why we want to build a streaming data pipeline. And I'm doing three different talks in this series. So uh, tonight's this week's is about um, an example of building it, like why you'd want to build it and to show it actually in action. And then uh, next week, I'm going to talk about one of the pieces in a lot more detail, all about Kafka Connect. And the following week, I'll talk in a lot more detail all about uh, KSQL DB. So no one's piped up and said they can't see my screen. Um, I was trying to avoid that thing where I say, like, can everyone see my screen? But uh, I didn't quite have the confidence that it was working, but uh, I guess it is. 
So let's talk about what Kafka is to start with. Kafka is an event streaming platform. And not everyone always realizes this. A lot of people think of Kafka maybe as like a message broker or like, like a pub sub queue and it does those things, but it does a lot more. So one of the important things when we think about building out these pipelines and using Apache Kafka is exactly what it can do for us. And Kafka can sit at the heart of the systems that we build and enable us to kind of link them together in a nicely scalable and powerful, but also quite loosely coupled way. So we can integrate our applications, our databases, our platforms, our Hadoops, all those kind of different things using Kafka as like this central nervous system. But at the heart of it, Apache Kafka, it's like it's an event streaming platform. It's super capable and scalable and immense. But at the heart of it is this very simple concept of the log. And the log is kind of like really what makes it such a powerful idea. And around it, we've got these different APIs and some of those we're going to talk about tonight. So at the heart of it is this immutable event log. And it's app end only and it's immutable. So something happens, we write it to the log and you can't change it. It is immutable. You can wish you can like you've done something differently or you had a conversation and wish you'd not said that thing but you can't go back and change it you can kind of like try and fix it after the event and maybe you put wrote something wrong so then you try and write something right to kind of like counteract it but it's app end only and it's immutable and because of that it's got some very very powerful features so this log is a kind of like a, a conceptual thing when we're thinking about it from a slightly higher level of view the way that we actually interact with it is through structures of data called topics. And if you're from a, like, a database background like I am, these are kind of like what you would know of as tables in a database. So you might have a stream of uh, clicks on a website or orders being placed or things like that. And whilst Kafka is an event streaming platform, it's not just events that we capture on it. We can capture fact, uh, reference information as well. So we've got like facts, we've got like clicks on a website, we've got orders being placed. But we've also got like reference information here, like customers. And like customers themselves aren't events, like an order being placed, but that information about a customer is an event. A customer gets created, it gets changed, it gets updated, and those events we can use, we capture them on Kafka topics, and we can actually take the state from a Kafka topic and work with it. And we're going to see that this evening. Topics are partitioned. And within a partition, you have a, this guarantee of strict ordering. So you're guaranteed that the order in which an event gets written to a partition within a topic is the exact order with which you'd read it. So again, that's a super powerful characteristic when we think of building systems. And partitions are our unit of scale. So if we want to do uh, parallel processing, we have a, a single topic which you can consume in parallel based on the partitions in a topic. The messages on a topic are actually just key value bytes. And this is a very obvious concept for some people and less obvious for others. Because if you think of a database, you go to a database and you'd say, I'd like to insert these values. And kind of like several layers removed from that, there's like some bytes being written onto a disk. But as a developer, you say, here's the thing I'd like to write. And it just does it. Kafka says, I will store key value bytes for you. I'll store a key, which might have a structure within it, it might not, and I'll store a value which might be a single byte. It might be a hugely complex structure with arrays and all kind of stuff within it, but it's just key value bytes. So as developers, we have to decide how we're going to serialize and therefore deserialize that data. So we'll talk about this a little bit today, but we'll talk about it in a lot more detail next week when we get into the guts of Kafka Connect. But when you're writing data to Kafka, you have to decide how you're going to serialize it. When you're reading from Kafka, you have to know how it was serialized so you can deserialize it correctly. And this is one of the things that's really important to get right up front. Um, so you can use something like Avro, you can use Protobuf. Protobuf support has just been added into the Confluence Schema Registry. Avro has been there for a long time. It's been added, support for Protobuf has been added into Confluence Schema Registry uh, just last week in the 5.5 release. You can use JSON. JSON Schemas is available in Confluence Schema Registry. JSON in its own without a schema is not such a great idea, and CSV is like a terrible idea, so don't do that. When it comes to reading data from a Kafka topic, each consumer has got its own position. And this is really, really useful because unlike kind of like a traditional messaging queue that you might think of, where you have to kind of like subscribe to it and the message is stored there, and when you've read it, it's gone, 
where you have like a set of defined subscribers and when they've all read it, the message is gone. In Kafka, data's persisted until you tell Kafka the, uh, the data, we're gonna keep it for a certain amount of time or a certain size, or we're gonna keep it forever. So any consumer can come along with the appropriate security privileges and say, I would like to read the messages from this topic. So Sally comes along and kind of starts from a certain point in the log and reads forward and reads those messages. And then Fred comes along and goes to a certain different point in the log. And Kafka knows where each consumer has got to. So it'll say, well, Fred got to kind of like offset 10 last time. So when Fred reconnects and says, can I have some new messages, it'll carry on from there. And Sally from a different place and George comes along from a different place. But this means that you can have different applications using the same data, not knowing have to, having to know about each other. They simply say, well, here is a topic. I have the security permissions to read from it. I'll read from it. And then we make sure that the, the topic itself retains the data for as long as we need it for like, the business purposes that we're storing it. So this is a very, very rapid overview of Apache Kafka. It's based on the log. It persists data. It's not deleted as soon as you've read it. Uh, you have different consumers, uh, different consumers, producers, different APIs. If you want to go and learn like a load ton more about it, you can get these books for free. Uh, go to the URL, scan the QR code. I'll publish all of these links afterwards. I'll make sure they get sent, uh, I guess, through Eventbrite. I'll put them on Twitter. Uh, anywhere where good slides are shared, I'll share them on there. Uh, and you can get these links. If you do the Twitters, by the way, uh, at I'm off is me. You can follow me, tweet me there. Uh, LGC jog is the, uh, the hashtag for this. But let's get on to streaming data pipelines. That's kind of what we're here for this evening. And streaming data pipelines is like it's a fancy way of talking about things that we've done for a while now, which is connecting different systems together. And in the past, it was just kind of like, actually it was called like ETL or something like boring and old school like that. But we still do it, but data pipelines sounds more fancy. We're data engineers now with data pipelines. But we're basically talking about taking data from one place and putting it somewhere else. And we do that for different reasons. So perhaps we do this kind of pretty common thing that people use Kafka for, where you take data maybe from a database. And we say, you want to take that data, it's in a transactional operational system, and we're going to go and put it somewhere else because we can offload the analytics work and do it somewhere where it's cheaper to store the data, it's maybe more scalable, and so on. We use Kafka here as the point of ingest from the source system and the egress out to the target system. But we get some really good benefits from this. One is we decouple what we're designing. We say, over in the database, oops, where's my cursor gone? There's we go. Over in the database, something happens. So we're going to stream it into Kafka. And then we say, well, we've got an analytics system up here and we need some data in it so we can stream it from Kafka. What we're not having to say is, okay, we've got a database here and we need to stream data to Amazon S3. So we need to build a kind of like a technology specific integration. And those integrations exist, don't get me wrong, there's tons of different ways to take data from a database and shunt it to S3. But at that point, you're committed to, we're gonna use this database and S3. But what happens if you want that data somewhere else also? If you're using Kafka, you've got the data in Kafka because you can say something happens, so we put it into Kafka. And then you say, well, putting it into S3 because that's what we started off with or that's what another team is doing. So we've already got the data in Kafka. And we're also going to go and put it into HGFS. Maybe we're the same team wanting to try out different analytics platforms, maybe we're different teams. But because we persist data in Kafka, it means that we can consume it multiple different times, completely independently from each other. If S3 went down, for example, this HGFS bit would keep on reading that data. When the S3 connector came back online, it would pick up where it got to in reading the data. But this is a fairly rudimentary example of a data pipeline because all we're doing is shunting data from one place to another place. And Kafka provides us the back pressure and the scalability and the fault tolerance and so on, but we're just shunting data around. But actually, you can use Kafka itself and do stream processing within it to say, well, that data that we're shunting around for analytics or whatever, well, the data that comes in, it's normalized and we've got order events and they refer to uh, customers and so on. We can use Kafka to join those together and write the resulting enriched data back into Kafka and then stream that down to a target. So instead of saying we take raw data and we write it raw data to a target and then we do some processing over there before we can use it, we say as the events happen, we stream them into Kafka, we do some stream processing so that as the events arrive, we're enriching them, we're writing them back to a Kafka topic and that's streaming down to our target. And that's the kind of thing I'm going to show you this evening. 
Another benefit of doing things this way is that we benefit from the more loosely coupled approach because we say, okay, to start with the database, we've got orders being created in the database. Our customer information is held in the database. That's how we do things today. Next week, we decide, well, we're going to move away from using a database and our orders are going to get created by a new system. We're going to write a service that's not using that old database. It's doing its own thing. That service is going to expose those order events directly into Kafka. Well, the rest of the pipeline is unchanged. We keep on pulling the customer information from the database. Our stream processor says, I've got an order event and I've got to look it up to the customer information within Kafka. We don't really change much. If the schema remains the same, it's actually just the same topic that we're feeding with order events just from a different place. If the schema differs, we write another stream processor to kind of like wrangle it as necessary and do the same join. And then pushing the data downstream, it's still the same data that we're pushing downstream, just happens to be coming from a different place. So some really, really powerful benefits from more loosely coupling things this way. It lets us evolve how we build different systems. So let's talk about how we actually go about building it. Those are kind of like some of the reasons why people build them out and the kind of benefits of doing it in Kafka, but how are we going to do it? Streaming data pipelines, they're about integrating different systems and probably about doing some processing along the way. That processing might be like super complex joins and aggregations and whatever's. It might simply be filtering and saying, well, we want to drop out this type of record. Or we want to change the schema to kind of like flatten out this message payload here or create a what's it there. Processing and integration. So when it comes to integration, we have an API for that already with an Apache Kafka. And that API is Kafka Connect. So if you're using Apache Kafka, you already have Kafka Connect. And Kafka Connect is this API that lets you pull in data from systems upstream into Kafka and push it from Kafka down to other systems. So maybe you use it to build end-to-end -end pipelines, pulling data in from here and pushing it down to there with Kafka just as the broker and kind of like the scalable persistence layer. Or maybe you use it for pulling in data to go and drive a system. Or you've got an application that's writing data into Kafka that you want to push down to a target system. So Kafka Connect can act as a source or a target or both. And working with Kafka Connect is pretty easy. So it's just configuration. So my background, I should have introduced myself a bit better at the beginning, but my background is in analytics and it's in databases and data warehousing and all that kind of stuff. I'm not really a coder, okay? I whisper it because I'm at a Java uh, meetup, but I don't actually write Java. What I can write is JSON. And to use Kafka Connect, you just specify your JSON configuration. You say, I've got some data and it's in a database or use a JDBC source connector. Here's my database, and here are the tables that I'd like to pull in from the database into Kafka. You say, how do you want to serialize it? So when you're building out pipelines, you've got to sit and think, how am I going to serialize my data? I'm not just going to kind of like go eeny, meeny, miny, moe and pick the one which works first or that I found on Stack Overflow or whatever. You actually need to think and consider how we're going to do this in the best way possible. And I would say this side of the screen, not that side of the screen, but you need to pick one of those and usually stick with it. And Kafka Connect is this pluggable architecture. So it's very, very cool. Tune in next week to find out all about how it works under the covers and how you deploy it and so on and so on. But you basically have connector plugins, which are the jars that you say, I'm going to connect to a database, I'm going to connect to another message queue, I'm going to connect to wherever else. You can use transforms on the data to modify it as it passes through. And you've got converters, which say, I'm going to serialize it to Protobuf. I'm going to serialize it to Avro. But because this pluggable architecture, it means that someone can write a connector to say, I'm going to pull in data from this funky system here. I know the API or whatever, but the person writing that plugin doesn't have to say, oh, and now I need to know how to serialize it and so on, because that's done by a converter. Anyway, tune in next week for that part. So you go to Confluent Hub, a great place to go and get different connectors and plugins and transformations, type in the technology you want to work with and go and pull it down from there. So Kafka Connect, part of Apache Kafka. The plugins that you use are licensed differently. You've got com community ones, you've got vendor ones, and so on. So integration, we've talked about Kafka Connect. Stream processing, you can do in lots of different ways. Stream processing, we're talking about taking a stream of events. So an event comes in, we're going to process the event. We're not going to take kind of like batches. We're not going to say, I'm going to take my data, I'm going to go and write it to a bucket, and then once an hour, I'll kind of like go along and process all of that data. It's all about taking the events as they happen and sometimes building out stateful uh, workloads on top of that 
so you can reason about the events as they come in relative to others that have happened. And Apache Kafka has got its own stream processing API called Kafka Streams. You've got Kafka Streams, you've got the stream processing frameworks as well. And you've also got something called KSQL DB. So KSQL DB, it's a source available um, product from Confluence um, and it's built on top of Kafka Streams. So it's the evolution of KSQL, if you're familiar with that. And KSQL DB lets you use SQL to express your stream processing uh, transformations or applications. So it's really, really powerful. It's very accessible because it's SQL. So what KSQL DB does is it basically subscribes to Kafka topics that you're interested in. So you've got data that comes into Kafka from wherever. It could come in from your own producing application. It could come in from Kafka Connect, feeding it from a source database or another message queue or wherever else you've got data coming in to a Kafka topic. KSQL DB subscribes to that. And in KSQL DB, you declare your transformation. You say, I would like to select certain values from this stream that match a given predicate. And the results of that transformation are written back on to a Kafka topic. So because it's written back onto a Kafka topic, it's just a Kafka topic. And you can consume that with any application that reads from a Kafka topic, your own consuming application, Kafka Connect, or indeed KSQL DB. So you can daisy chain these different transformations and we're going to see in the demo exactly what they look like, but it's just SQL. So we can say, well, we're going to reconsume that topic and we're going to enhance it further. So maybe the first step is we take the source data, we apply a schema, we clean it up a bit and we write back that back into Kafka because maybe that clean data set or that clean stream of data is already useful for other applications. But then for our purpose, we're going to take that, we're going to filter it, we're going to aggregate it, we're going to do whatever, further steps in KSQL DB. But that data that we're writing back into Kafka, we can also use elsewhere. We can say, well, let's use Kafka Connect and we'll push it down to another data store. We'll go and push that into a database or into Snowflake or into S3 or to BigQuery or somewhere else where we want to analyze that data. So you then have source data coming in from a system. You have KSQL DB refining it, filtering it, doing whatever to it, writing it back to a Kafka topic, which we then hook up to Kafka Connect to stream down to our target. But we can also use that data that we've enriched to drive our applications and our services. We've got data coming in, we want to filter it, we want to do whatever, and that's going to drive a service. So we can say, well, we've maybe got, um, we've got click data from our website. We're going to write a SQL statement here, which identifies suspicious behavior or something like that. And when we identify something that meet, meets our certain predicates, that gets written to a new Kafka topic that our service can subscribe to. So our service that's responsible for processing those kind of events, it doesn't have to subscribe to the, the original source stream and kind of like apply all of that cleansing logic first before it does its thing. It simply subscribes to a prepared stream of events that it just then does its thing against. You'll notice that it's called KSQL DB. It's not just about SQL that we're kind of like applying to streams of events in Kafka. It's got this DB bit in the name, which is kind of puzzling to some people, but it actually makes a lot of sense because what we can do within KSQL DB is we can build stateful aggregations and build and maintain those stateful aggregations in a very scalable way. And we can query those aggregations. It can act as a database in its own right. So you can have a source of data coming in. You could declare basically a materialized view in KSQL DB and say, take these um, uh, uh, orders being placed. I would like to count up. I'd like to sum up the uh, amount of the transactions, group it by account. And then for my service, I can query that directly. So for my service, I just do a REST call into KSQL DB and say, for this particular key, what's the value? What's the uh, sum of the transaction amount for this given account ID? And it'll say, well, the balance is this, that's the sum of the transaction amount. So you can query the state of a stateful aggregation in KSQL DB directly from an external application. So KSQL DB lets us do this stream processing, this kind of like streaming ETL idea where we enrich and enhance pipelines and write them back into Kafka topics. But we can also build stateful aggregations that we can query directly from outside KSQL DB, hence the DB bit in the name. So let me show you an example of actually putting these things together and it'll make a bit more sense what it is that we're doing. So the example I've got 
we've got some data being generated and it's ratings. It's kind of like ratings for, like you go to a website, you can leave reviews or like you've got a, a company and you're leaving reviews for them and it's stuff like this. So here's the, uh, the schema. We've got users uh, and they leave ratings, which you've got an ID. They say star rating from on a scale of one to five. Five is brilliant, one is awful. Are they happy or not? Uh, you've got things like what was the channel? So was it on a website? Was it on an Android app, an iOS app? And then a message, like were they happy or were they not? And we're going to take that data and we're going to do various different things with it. The first thing we're going to do is we're simply going to filter it and push it out into Elasticsearch so we can build a real-time dashboard on top of it. So a stream of events happening somewhere, they get written into a Kafka topic, we take that data, we push it to Elasticsearch. We then do things like say, well, we've got a user ID, but we don't know who that user is. We can pull in that information from a database, we can join that to the stream, and we can filter it. So we could do things like, well, let's take all of the ratings that are coming in, let's find out which customer it was, and customers have got different statuses. They're kind of like bronze uh, uh, status, like VIP status, they're platinum customers, they're like super important to us, or less important, whatever. And we can say, well, based on that criteria, we're going to handle these events differently. If you have a customer come in and leave a review and they're really, really unhappy and they're a platinum customer, which we know because we can find that out from the, the information we hold in a database, well, let's send out an alert. Let's do a push notification to our ops team and say, this customer here is super important. They spend a ton of money with us and they've left a bad rating. We probably want to do something to try and address it before they churn and go elsewhere. We're an online company, people are just going to shop around. If they have a bad experience with us, they might not come back. So let's see if we can fix that. We can do that in an event-driven way. As soon as they leave that bad review, we can do something about it. So we're going to see how using KSQL DB and Kafka Connect, we build up elements in this pipeline. So the code for all of this is on GitHub. Uh, you can go to that address uh, here. I ran a workshop at QCon uh, back in March, back when it, kind of like, it seemed normal to go on travel places and not stay at home. Um, but it's got all the step-by-steps. So you can actually spin up the environment on your own machine. You just need Docker and Docker Compose and actually try this out and play around with it all. So I'm going to uh, switch away from my screen. I'm going to quick look at the questions. I can see a bunch of stuff happening in the chat. I'm going to have a little uh, sip of my beverage. So let me uh, answer some of these questions. <clears throat> So someone said, how long is the session? It's an hour. Uh, we'll run until eight o'clock UK time, so another half hour, but I'll keep on talking until someone kills the meeting. Um, what's about latency? If there's an aggregation of data as a process. Um, so when we aggregate, it does uh, like windowed aggregations and it re-emits them as it changes. So you get kind of like late arriving data. So we'll see that in the demo. Um, persistence. Uh, so the second question is related to persistence, if that won't be costly in case of performance. So you configure Kafka to keep the data as long as you want it. Um, and some people keep it forever, like the New York Times keep all of their stuff in Kafka forever. And if they need to rebuild uh, their site and so on, you just replay from the beginning of that topic, so that's kind of useful. If you're talking about doing ad hoc queries in KSQL DB, which I should have said KSQL DB is not designed for ad hoc querying. That's why you kind of like process the data and then push it somewhere like S3, which is designed for it, or Snowflake or something like that. So Kafka is a sequential read through the topic. So you wouldn't say, I'm going to keep all my data in case equal uh, in Kafka and then just run case equal DB queries against it to do lots of ad hoc stuff. That would be a bad idea because it would suck for performance. Uh, the link for the books, uh, someone can post that. Thank you. Uh, you have done. Uh, again, I'll post all of the links afterwards on Twitter and stuff like that. When using CDC, how to backfill historical data into Kafka. So we're about to see this in the demo, but the short answer is that most connectors will bootstrap it. Debezium bootstraps it into the Kafka topic unless you tell it not to. Um, is case, so question was, is case equal DB open source? It is source available. It's licensed under the Confluent community license. There's a FAQ online which goes through kind of like what you can and can't do, or there's the actual license if you like reading that kind of thing. Um, the slides will be available later on, on the slides, which tool do you use to create them? I actually wrote a blog about this because everyone ask, always asks like, how do, you, how do you create these drawings and stuff? Um, it's a tool called Paper uh, on the iPads, but actually, so arm.net uh, is my blog, you can go and see, and I, I wrote a thing all about it. Um, right, I'm, I'm gonna do the demo and then I'll come back to the chat. 
but these are some good questions. And if I don't get a chance to an answer at the end, um, bug me on Twitter. So at I'm off is, is my Twitter handle. I'm also going to share a link uh, at the end to a, uh, or in fact, I'll share it now. There is a Confluent community Slack group. Um, so scan the QR code or go to cnfl.io slash Slack. There's like 15,000, 16,000 people on there, bunch of different channels, including one for KSQL DB, including one for Connect. Post all your questions there if I don't get to them in this talk. So let me go to this. So on my, this. there we go. Okay, so what I've got here uh, is KSQL DB. I'm going to show you Kafka Connect as well, but KSQL DB can act as the control layer for Kafka Connect. If you don't want to use KSQL DB, you don't have to. Okay, you can use Kafka Connect, it's part of Apache Kafka, it's got a REST API, it's just easier, it's a more streamlined demo if I just show you all from within one interface, but you don't have to use it if you don't want to. So KSQL DB, we talked about it, an event streaming database, purpose built for stream processing apps, it kind of all sounds very funky, but let's see what that actually means. So to start off with, we're going to say, well, what topics do I have in my, in my uh, Kafka cluster at the moment? And we've got a topic here called ratings. And based on what I showed you earlier, we can probably guess what's in it. But I'm going to say, well, let's have a look at what's in this topic. I'm going to say print ratings. And it's going to say, well, here's what's in the topic. So KSQL DB, you can do all your fancy stream processing. You can do your kind of like querying stateful aggregations. You can also use it. It's just a very handy consumer and producer, by the way, for Kafka. You can say, show me what topics I've got, go and take that topic, figure out the serialization format, deserialize it and show me what's on it. Kind of useful. You can use Kafka Cat, you can use Avro Console Consumer, you can use other tools and stuff as well. KSQL uh, DB is also kind of useful. So we can see the payload that we've got. We can see we've got a key, we've got a uh, timestamp on it, we've got the value here. So this is the data that I showed you on that screenshot. Uh, that we've got coming in. So we've got a, an ID for the rating, we've got a user ID, the star rating, and so on. And what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to create myself a stream in KSQL DB on top of that topic. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm registering it, I'm declaring that stream on top of that existing topic. So we say create stream on top of this topic and the value format, the format of the value part of the message is Avro. If I say describe ratings, we can see we've got a stream and it's got a schema, which is kind of cool. This is where it comes back to that serialization thing. Because when we created this topic here, the person who created the producer writing the data into it made a very, very wise decision. They said, this data that I'm writing, someone else is going to use it. And this someone else probably doesn't want to have to phone me up and say, this kind of like lump of JSON or CSV that you've sent me, I think this is the schema, but can I just check it with you? And well, I assumed it was that, and then it changed and my thing broke. Instead, they said, I'll serialize it as Avro or Protobuf as a Confluent Platform 5.5. I'll serialize it as that, which means that we have an explicit schema. That schema gets stored in the Confluent Schema Registry. And when you can come to consume that data, your KSQL DB, your Kafka Connect, your native consumer application connects to the schema registry, it pulls down the schema and it can deserialize it. So in case equal DB, we can say, let's point at that particular topic. Let's put this out right. We can point at that particular topic and it'll go and fetch the schema and it'll apply it. And then because we've got a schema, we can write some projections against that data. We can say, show me just the stars, the channel and the message from ratings. I'm going to say emit changes because we want to know as stuff changes in that stream. If you're at all familiar with KSQL, KSQL DB, this is what's known as a push query because we're subscribing to that list of changes as they happen. So now we're looking at real time as these events come in. So we can see the star rating, the channel it was left through, and the message that was left against it. So this is just showing it on my terminal. And we can filter the data as well. So instead of saying, like, show everything that comes in as of now, or indeed, you can also say, go back to the beginning of the topic. If we do what's called an offset reset to the earliest, we can then query everything from the beginning of the topic. But now I'm just gonna say, show me all the messages as they arrive, but apply a filter, apply a predicate. So we're gonna say where, oops, where the star rating is less than three. So as each message comes in, it's gonna process that, it's gonna apply that predicate, and it's only gonna return the result if the message that's arrived, the star rating is less than three. It's a SQL predicate. Most people are familiar with SQL. What not everyone is familiar with 
is this syntax. Most people are familiar with a similar syntax, create object as select. Database world, create table as select. Create this table over here with the results of this select against this static lump of data over here. In case equal DB, create a stream as the results of this continuous query over here. Create stream power ratings as. So now we're selecting these fields here and we're writing a new stream. So the first create stream that we ran was says create stream ratings against an existing topic. Declare a stream against an existing topic and it's got a schema. This one here, we're saying create a new stream as the results of this. Which means that if I say show streams, we can see we've got a new stream here called poor ratings and that's backed by a Kafka topic. If we wanted, we could have changed this when we created it here. We could have said with Kafka topic, it's got a different name, change the partitioning and so on and so on. We're just using the defaults. So we've now got a Kafka topic and I could say print poor ratings. And it says, okay, here is this Kafka topic. This Kafka topic, it's got a serialization, it's Avro, and it's also got a schema, it's got a payload. So we can see here, it's got user ID, stars, channel, and message. So we've modified the schema of the source, and we're picking out just particular fields, and we're applying a predicate. So if the star rating is less than three, write a message with just these four fields out to a new Kafka topic. And it's a new Kafka topic, so we can do what we want with it as just a Kafka topic. We're using KSQLDB as our stream processor. So what we can do is, let me uh, split my screen here. I'm going to create another um, KSQL prompt. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is on the top here, we're going to show all of the messages as they arrive. Okay. So what I said there was uh, the auto offset reset latest. So go to the end of the topic and just show new messages as they arrive. Print ratings, show every message that arrives in the source topic. Okay, so they're, they're taking over. And in the bottom one, we're gonna say, just show me messages from the poor ratings topic. So that new topic that we're populating with our stream processor. And if I look for stars, you can see that. So you can see every single, so this is a live feed of messages as they're arriving in the topic. So here you've got messages arriving all the time with lots of different star ratings down here. It's only when you get a message on the source topic arriving with a star rating less than three that it gets written to the target topic. I'm making it sound more complicated than it really is. We've got a source topic coming in. We've written a SQL statement which says, select from this source topic where the predicate is less than this and write it to the new one and just write these certain fields. And because it's just a Kafka topic, we can do other things with it. So let me show you taking this data Let's get rid of that and writing it somewhere else. So now we get to Kafka Connect. So now we're going to say, go and create a connector. We're going to use the Elasticsearch Sync Connector because guess what? We're going to write it to Elasticsearch. We're going to take data from this topic called Power Ratings. It's going to go to Elasticsearch at this place. We're going to pull out a field from the metadata of the Kafka message, the timestamp, which is part of the metadata, and we're going to write it as a new field in the target schema. So this here is a single message transform which I talked about very briefly when I talked about Kafka Connect. So this happens as part of the Kafka Connect connector. The data comes from Kafka. We are adding this particular field from the metadata and that will end up with that in Elasticsearch. So we've created the connector. I could say show connectors and I'll say we've got a connector here that's running. Okay, it's the Elasticsearch sync connector and it's running. The data generated by the way is also a Kafka Connect connector except it's a source connector. And if I go over to um, Elast uh, not Elasticsearch, if I go over to Kibana, what we can do is this. So if you're not familiar with it, Kibana, it's a, a nice front end for Elasticsearch. If you're not familiar with Elasticsearch, by the way, I should have introduced it. It's a very cool um, document database, I suppose you'd call it. You can just chuck data out and it works very nicely. So I'm creating what's called an index pattern on top of this data that's streaming through into Elasticsearch from Kafka. And we've created that. And so now we can go and look at this data. And if I do this and set it to refresh every second, which is probably a bad idea, but we can see this data arriving all the time. And if I do this and put that up there, you can see those messages arriving. And I could also say print, for ratings, 
and we can see the live stream of data arriving here. So the data flows into the topic and that gets pushed down with Kafka Connect immediately into Elasticsearch. And then because I've set a refresh in Kibana of every second, it updates on the screen kind of almost straight away. And we've, what we've got in Elasticsearch is the documents that we're sending through split out into the different fields with the schema because we are using Avro. It'll work with JSON, it's just a bit more fiddly. So let's close that for now and let's go back and do some more cool things with this data. Because what we've got in this data, if we have a look at the uh, flow ratings, is we've got the stars and we know if they're happy or not because they've left a message in the star rating. And we've also got the person, but we don't know who they were. And as I mentioned uh, in the introduction to this, it's kind of useful to know about these people. So let's pull in information about these people from a database. So I've got a database. Uh, I'm using MySQL. The principle that I'm showing you here applies to any relational database. The specific tools might differ, but uh, the concepts are exactly the same. So we've got data in the database and uh, we've got information about our customers. So our customers have got an ID, they've got names, and they've also got this club status. So we're going to pull this data into Kafka. I'm going to use Kafka Connect again for this. So let's go up here and get ourselves a bit of space. We're going to create a source connector this time. There's a bit more configuration. It's a little bit more fiddly. MySQL connector, we're using the Debezium MySQL connector. It goes the, against the, uh, the bin log uh, of MySQL. If you want to know more about connectivity with databases, go and look up a talk called No More Silos Integrating Kafka and uh, Databases. Um, it's online. I did it at Kafka Summit and a bunch of other places. Uh, I'll try to remember to put a note uh, in the links that I send out, but it's easily Googleable. And it goes into all the stuff you want to know about databases, change data capture, log based against query based, and all the kind of questions that you'll probably be asking. Here I'm using Debezium. It'll take a snapshot of the table. It'll take a snapshot of this particular table that I've specified. It'll do some stuff to it using single message transforms, and it'll write it to a Kafka topic. So we'll say show connectors. And again, I'm just using KSQLDB as the control point here, but you could use the Kafka Connect REST API directly if you want to. You could use Confluent Control Center to control it. It's just an API with various different tools to work with it if you want to. We've got our source connector that says it's running, which is always good in a demo. And if I go and say show topics, you'll see we've got a new topic here called uh, customers. If I say print that topic, and now I'm going to say from beginning, because what we've done is we've taken a copy of that database table and written it to the topic. But if my offset is set to latest, I won't actually see anything when I print because it will be printing from the end of the topic and nothing's changing yet in the database. So they say from beginning, show me everything in that topic. It says, okay, here's everything in the topic. We've got a key, which is based on the ID of the customer and about information about the customer. So now, we're going to take that data and we're going to declare ourselves a table. Okay, so before we said show streams and we looked at the stream objects. And a stream is just a Kafka topic with a schema. Okay, it's key value events that are happening unbounded continuously. Whereas a table is value for a given key. Okay, it's key values. So our key is the customer ID and that value might change. So a database is tables, okay? It's value for a given key. You can do key value lookups. So in case equal DB, we create a table, show tables. We've got a table called customers. What I can do here is I can query that table. You'll notice I've set the offset to the earliest because we want to go back to the beginning of the topic. And here is my table. And if we change that query and we say uh, from customers and it changes, just showing the first five, you'll see basically what we've got in my SQL which is the customer ID, the first name, last name, email, and so on. But what happens if we say from customers where ID equals 42? It'll say, well, we don't have anything yet. Okay, it's a continuous query. Okay, you've noticed I've got emit changes there. I don't have control back, it's a continuous query. What happens if I go and change something in the database? Okay, let's go to the database at the bottom of the screen here. It's MySQL. We create a row. We create a row, the database connector takes it from the transaction log, writes it to a Kafka topic, KSQLDB says, okay, we now have something which matches this condition. I'll emit that change. It doesn't return control because it's a continuous query. And at the moment, this is the value for that key. 
what happens if we realize that when we created the row, we forgot to give an email address. So let's go and update that row and specify an email address. Okay, the state has changed. And if I go back to case equal DB and say, show me the state for this key, I'll say, well, here is the current state. The current state is this. Here's the kind of like the state change log, which you can subscribe to if you want to. Here's the kind of like the actual state. And we can go and update it some more. And it's, uh, it's Rick, so of course he's got platinum status with us. So now we go and make that change in the database and that state change comes through. So what we've got in case equal DB is a stream of events, the ratings, and we've got a table, reference table, which is basically our data that we want to look up out to. Every event that comes in, we want to be able to join to that. So let's go and join to that. So what we've got down here is a join query, which looks like this, and it's SQL. If you know SQL, you can write join queries. We're going to select the rating ID, the message, and the channel. We're going to do a bit of um, manipulation here with the data. We're going to concatenate some fields. We're going to change the name. We're going to pull it in from the rating stream. We're going to do a left join to customers. Um, I'm going to do the join on the user ID matches the ID in the table. So we do that and we get all of this stuff. And the reason it's scrolling by to kind of like a rate of knots is that we said offset earliest. We've gone back to the beginning of the topic and the topic was being created by an hour ago when I spun this uh, test platform up. So we've got all of that data that was in the topic, we're joining to it and at the moment writing it to the screen, which is fairly uninteresting. Much more interesting is to persist this to a new topic. Create stream as select, create stream ratings and customer data with, here we're gonna change the topic name. You can override the topic name, you can change the partitioning and so on and so on. And now we write that to a new topic, show topics. Okay, we're going to new topic here called ratings enriched. I can print that if I want to. Okay, let's pause that so you can actually see what's happening. Here's our Kafka topic. It's a Kafka topic that we're populating. We've got a value field, it's got the rating ID, it's got the club status, it's got that email address. It's got the details of the event which arrived, Let's join it straight away to the information about the customer if we have it, write it back on to a Kafka topic. So the rate has uh, slowed down. You can see the timestamp here, 649 UTC. This is like now a live feed of events arriving, being enriched with this information. And the information is in sync with whatever happens in the database. We saw a moment ago when I make changes to that row that I've inserted, it updated in the case equal DB uh, table almost straight away. So now let's take that data. We're going to create another stream. We're going to create one which is going to be based on this data. I'm going to filter it out where the, the star rating is less than three and the club status is platinum. So now we've got a separate stream um, of ratings left by customers or platinum status where the, the rating they left was less than three. We can go and print that stream there. Let's have a look at that stream. So here are all our platinum customers who have left ratings where they weren't happy, star rating of two. Turns out the gen data generator doesn't always kind of like align the two. So sometimes you get happy messages for bad ratings, but it's based on the predicate against the stars. And what we can do with all of this, we're going to stick it in Elasticsearch. It's just a Kafka topic. You could write your own service, which subscribes to that topic and sends out push notifications. You could use it to stream it to loads of different places. You could write it down to uh, Snowflake for your data science team to go and analyze. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're just going to push it down to Elasticsearch. We're going to push a couple of different topics. So the enriched topic and the unhappy platinum customers one. So that goes to Elasticsearch. And we can go and look at that in Kivana. So let's load that up. So this is showing it for the last 15 minutes. And you can see here, we've got the user. So 1951 uh, BST, so British summertime is kind of the time in the UK. Here's the user, they're a platinum user. The star ratings are all one. You can see they're not very happy, but you can see we're driving this analytics through the data we've enriched. We can break it down by channel, by club status. So the channel, could be based just on those raw events arriving. But the club status couldn't, because we have to take the uh, rating, which comes from the source event, and we need to know the club status, which comes from the customer information. So we're joining both of those in case equal DB, writing it to a new Kafka topic, which we'll then stream down to here. So with Kafka, it's all about being able to use the right tool for the job in hand. 
Sometimes you want to use an analytics tool like Elasticsearch, but you can't necessarily join the data in it easily. So you say, well, we'll use Kafka for doing that. But you're not necessarily going to serve the analytics queries themselves through Kafka or KSQL DB. It's about using the most appropriate tool. So we've got that data. We can see if we set the refresh on there, um, it's going to be updating all the time. So we've got our, our live view of it here. You've got our ratings detail down here. So all of the ev events that are arriving. So you can see here's the name and the, the club status and so on. So that's a live feed of the data. The last thing I want to show you um, before we do a few questions and useful links and stuff like that is how you can actually build out aggregations within KSQL DB. So one of the things that I've not talked about yet and I'm not going to do today, but I will in a fortnight's time, is about how KSQL DB is actually built and how you can deploy it and scale it and all the rest of it. But for now, it's built on top of Kafka Streams. Kafka Streams is built on top of Kafka, which are distributed systems. So you can scale it based on your partitioning and you can scale it out and out and out for high throughput and capacity and resilience. So we're going to build ourselves a stateful aggregation. We're going to take our information, our ratings for the customer data, and we're going to look at how many ratings did each customer leave per minute. So obviously if they're very happy customers or unhappy customers, they're leaving lots of ratings for that kind of granularity to make sense. But now we've actually pulled that information out and it breaks it down by window. So this is obviously, you can see it's test data. So you can see at one minute past six, this user here, they left 10 ratings. If I cancel that and go to the bottom here, you can see it's actually updating because it's 1853 UTC. And within that 1853 time window, all of these different people, you can see Lan A Tupin left four there, and then another event arrived, so the aggregation was re-emitted. And they left, you can see they left a, a couple more within that window, so it was updated to six, updated to seven, and so on. And what we can do is we can write that to a table. Okay, so let's take that aggregate query, and we write it to a table, because table's a key value, and the value here is the count, and the key is the, uh, the name plus the window, and we can query it. So querying it looks like the kind of the one I just showed you, but we're going to pick out just a particular user. So Rika Blaisdell, how many um, ratings did they leave based on a given window? So here I've done a minute window, which is daft. You probably do like five minutes or half hour, or depending on the business question you're answering, you would window the data accordingly. But here we can see how many ratings did that person leave within each uh, minute. And this is a push query. We can subscribe to this and we find out whenever the aggregate changes, so like here, 1854, first off there was one, and then within that minute, they've left another one, so the aggregate goes up to two and so on. That's a push query. Every time it changes, we find out that it's changed. But we could also do a pull query. We can say, select this information for a given key where the, uh, sorry, for a given key, and you can also filter it based on the window. So where the window uh, was greater than 1850, it says, okay, there are those ones. And here it says, well, query terminated back at the control because it's given us the current state. We've queried the state of that aggregate. And we can do it within KSQL. We could also do it using the REST API. So let me show you that very briefly. We're gonna open it up. I'm using Postman here. And we post it to the REST API uh, for KSQL. And we're gonna select from here. We're gonna say, well, that's, greater than 1850 or 1852 and run that. And it's say, okay, here's the answer. And you get a payload back. It says, well, this time frame here, there was 11. That time frame there, there was two. That time frame there, there was seven. But our application can query that stateful aggregation that we've built and persisted within KSQL DB for a given key. And say, for this key, what's the current value? So that's why the, the DB bit of KSQL comes in and why it's so very powerful because we're taking a stream of data, we're building aggregates against this, and we can query that state directly. Right, that is the end of the demo. It's also four minutes to the hour. So I would like to wrap up before I do some questions by sharing some very, very valuable links with you. Um, the slides will definitely be online afterwards. So the, the slides I will tweet, um, I'll put on the Eventbrite, if that's possible through that, I'll put on the LGC Slack. I'll put on uh, my own website, so talks.armoff.net. You can find them on there. If you can't find them anywhere, then email me, robin at confluence.io. If you want to learn more about Kafka, developer.confluence.io is where you need to go. 
there's a bunch of tutorials, there's a bunch of video stuff, there's blogs, there's all kinds of stuff there to kind of like get you started, learning Kafka, learning key SQL DB, learning Kafka streams, learning all the kind of good stuff like that. The Slack group I mentioned earlier, this is where you head to if you've got questions about using Kafka, about using Confluent Platform. There's a ton of people on there. It's a great community. People help each other out. Um, and there's lots of different channels. So there's a channel for KSQL DB, there's a channel for Kafka Connect, there's a channel for operating Kafka, for using clients with it, and so on. This is the books link that I shared earlier. I'll share it again. I'll make sure I tweet it because it's so very, very useful. You've got things like the Kafka Definitive Guide, and like Neha Marked is one of the people who wrote the original Apache Kafka. So it's kind of, it's a kind of useful book. Jay Kreps also um, one of the original writers and this brilliant book, I Love Logs. And like going into why is logs such a, a powerful uh, foundation on which to build a platform. So go along to those links there and learn a ton more about Kafka. I'll leave that on the screen. Um, I'll move that. And then I will go to the chat window and we'll do a few little questions. Um, it's brilliant that so many people have dialed in. I'll see if I can figure out how to uh, do this with my different screen sharing. So there's that. And where's the chat's gone? In the meantime, feel free to unmute yourselves uh, whilst I try and figure out my Zoom windows because I seem to have lost my uh, chat. There we go. More. There we go, chat. Hidden away. No. Nope. It's, uh, I can do Kafka till the cows come home, but I can't operate Zoom. There it is. Right. Right. It displays when you're trying to screen share and it kind of covers it. Um, so let's scroll back up. Uh, the link for the book people have shared. Um, open source, blah, blah, blah. It reopens. You mentioned KSQL DB as a database. Can we use it to get data in real time like any other database and get the same latency as other databases? Yes and no. So the query that I showed you then, we're kind of we're querying a database. Pull queries are still um, being implemented. So the one I showed you there, it, like it's totally valid. That wasn't kind of like just cheating. It actually works. But that's querying for a direct key. So you can't just say, here's my Oracle query, and now I'll just run it against KSQL DB. It won't work. You can't do things kind of like range queries and all that kind of funky stuff. But it's developing every release. So uh, if you're interested in it, give it a try, but don't be upset if it doesn't quite do everything that you're wanting it to yet. And like I said, it's much more about serving up state against the materialized view that you've built and populating in it. It's not about doing ad hoc queries against like loads of data that you've stored in Kafka. It kind of won't go so well if you try and do that. Uh, we're using ActiveMQ and Embedded Camel as our real ESB. What support does Kafka have for enterprise integration patterns? And is it possible to run Camel within Kafka as we can with ActiveMQ? Uh, that's a ton of stuff, which I don't necessarily know the answers to. Um, ActiveMQ, you can integrate with Kafka. Uh, I think, Peter, I think I've, you've helped me out on the mailing list before with that rail demo that I did. Um, so you can hook up uh, ActiveMQ and stream it into Kafka. There's a connector for that. Um, you can use Camel as a connector with Kafka Connect. Um, in terms of ESBs, there's a great article that I'll try and share afterwards um, called Kafka and ESB, Frenemies, Friends or Enemies, or something that Kai Werner wrote that talks a lot about kind of Kafka and ESBs and kind of where they sit. Um, if I had it on my clipboard, I would share it, um, but I'll try and remember to share that afterwards. You have my contact details, I think, Peter, if not, and I'll dig it out. Uh, does join operations scale well in a distributed environment? It depends. Uh, I mean, the way that you partition your data and lay out your data, you need to take care of. And I suppose what I would say with KSQL DB um, is that things like Oracle have got 40 or 50 years worth of development on them, maybe 40 years. So they do an awful lot of very, very clever stuff for you. And that's why Larry likes to charge you a lot of money for it. For very good reasons, it's a hugely good tool. So things like query optimization, things like how do I lay my data out, how do I serialize my data, a lot more of that is down to, to, to the developer to do. Um, so I'm not saying it because it doesn't do it, I'm saying it sets expectations that you will have to, you may well have to spend time seeing how it works for your particular use case. What if the schema changes after a while? Um, that's a great question and that's why you should use something which has explicit support for schemas because schemas do change and you want to manage that change gracefully and you want to be aware of that change. So if you're using schema registry, you can define schemas 
with varying levels of compatibility. So like forward compatible, backward compatible, fully compatible, because you want to make sure that your producers and your consumers can still work together with different versions of the schema. And if you're making a breaking change to the schema, you want to know that. And the scheme registry will say, that's not compatible. You're going to break things for these people who are reading that data. And then you will need to manage that. You'll need to write a, a stream processor, which implements the logic to actually go from one schema version to another, if you're doing something which can't be done implicitly. But if you're defining a new column without a default, or you're adding in a column which is based on a derivative of another, hey, you use KSQL DB to do that derivation and write to a new topic with that schema and kind of redirect your consumers. But the point of using schema registry is to enforce that compatibility so that you don't just randomly break stuff and so that you know when changes that you're making are going to break. Um, how does KSQL DB cope with hierarchical message structures? If you're talking about uh, nested structures, it just does. It supports nested structs, it supports arrays and so on. There's a, a dash greater than um, operator to access them. I, if you talk about kind of like, um, relational messages, like this one refers to that one, to that one, to that one, it doesn't. Uh, well, you can do joins between streams and stuff like that, but uh, you'd have to kind of clarify that. Um, someone's posted the link to the no more silos, thank you. Um, this looks good, but we suggest using the Java API or something to manage these streams as code. So you can use Kafka streams. And I um, should be well aware of my audience here. It's the London Java community. So if you would rather write Java code, please do. Please be my guest. The Kafka streams API is an extremely good one. People build very, very powerful things with it. Not everyone is able to write Java. So some people choose that they're gonna use SQL because it's just like more elegant than writing the Java thing, there's less boilerplate. The stuff that I showed you, like create stream is your stream processing application. There's no boilerplate stuff around it. When you deploy KSQL DB, you pass it your SQL statements, that's it. Tune in in two weeks to find out more. Some people prefer to use uh, Kafka streams. Sometimes Kafka streams does more. So KSQL DB is built on top of Kafka streams. So everything you can do in KSQL DB you can do in Kafka Streams by definition, it's built on top of it. Not everything you can do in Kafka Streams can you yet do in KSQL DB. So sometimes that's the kind of like the, the reason for it. So sometimes it's skills and personal choice. Sometimes it's kind of like what it'll actually do or not. Um, is there an overhead in managing topics? It seems that the number of topics in use could explode quickly. How do you manage that complexity? Uh, topics that have predicates in prior to topics have dependencies. Can you create a view of lineage? Whew. Okay, is there an overhead in managing topics? KSQL DB creates uh, temporary topics for repartitioning and like the ones that you're creating. So yes, in the same way that like relational databases have got like temp areas and stuff like that, there is that stuff which goes on. You don't get this stuff for free. Um, so there is an overhead, um, but it's in a sense managed for you because they're kind of like temporary topics that go away when you don't need them and so on. Um, topics which have predicates and prior topics have dependencies. KSQL DB won't let you get rid of something which is being used by something else. You have to kind of like terminate that. In terms of lineage, there is the data flow view in Confluent Control Center. Um, so Confluent Control Center is part of Confluent Platform. You can use it for as a, a developer license. So if you've got a single Kafka broker, like on my laptop here or something like that, you use Confluent Control Center and all its bits and pieces, including the data flow view, which shows how stuff links together. Um, if you want more than one broker, which you would do in production, then it's a, a commercial tool. Um, there's also an open source tool which analyzes Kafka streams topologies and kind of like builds out these nice graphical views. I guess you could point that to KSQL DB. I've not tried it. Um, where does the configuration get persisted? So um, KSQL DB is what's got, what has got what's called a command topic. So like all the commands you run are like stored in there. It's got a meta store, so it, it manages that. Uh, I think I've answered that KSQL DB of Kafka streams. Um, when you, I'm presuming it is when you want to start, when you want to join streaming data with current state. So. Yes, so when you, when you do the join, like I showed you, like events are coming in and we're going to join to customer information. That's joining to the current state of the customer information. Uh, can you mention again the blog talk that mentions uh, Kafka databases? So it's called No More Silos. Um, so let me see if I've got it on my clipboard. No more. There we go. 
So that was Alfred, if anyone's using it. Alfred's fantastic, it's got a clipboard thing. Uh, let me find, how do I send a chat? So everyone, there we go. So no more silos. There's also a blog that goes with it if you prefer blogs to slides and video. Um, can you encrypt data using streams? Uh, yes. Um, so there's, I believe one of our colleagues has written something funky which does encryption, um, but I don't, I don't have details of that. Is that the code to replicate the case scenarios showed? Is it possible to share? Yes, it's on the slides. Uh, let me go back up to that and show you where it is. So it's on, um, there's a, a, a Docker, sorry, a Git repository called Demo Scene, um, and it's where we put a, a ton of our examples. So if I show you that. So this repository here, so there's Confluent Inc slash examples. Uh, this one here where it's all curated and it all works. There's this one here, Demo Scene, which is where I tend to reside, where like all the demos and stuff that I've built and my colleagues have built, they go on here. And they certainly work when we wrote them and then maybe they don't work um, later on, but they certainly work when we wrote them. So this one here, Build a Streaming Pipeline, it works. Uh, nine hours ago, definitely works, it worked this evening. Um, so you can find the code on there and a bunch of other stuff as well. Right, I have to wrap up in a sec. Do you see the case equal stack working on top of Apache Pulsar in the future? I'd say that's kind of unlikely. Um, good articles about using Kafka for machine learning. My colleague, so let me put his name in here because I've mentioned him twice now. So Kai Werner, um, that's the anglicized writing. Um, so he's written two uh, really good blogs, the one about ESBs. He's also written a bunch of stuff about machine learning. Uh, go and look him up, you'll find him on Google and stuff. Um, he's got some good stuff there. Ah, oh, David had already shared the, the link, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up there because I've gone eight minutes over time. Thank you everyone for dialing in. Um, hopefully it was useful. Um, tweet me if you liked it, tweet me if you didn't like it. It's always good to get feedback. Uh, that's my Twitter up there, at I'm off. Talking next week all about Kafka Connect in a lot more detail, the week after KSQLDB in a lot more detail then. Thank you very much. <laughs>